Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly reminder that it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, brought to you by the magazine of Free Minds and Free Free Moins. Yeah, Free Moins. Yeah, free free Moins. <laughs> I'm Matt Welch, um, joined by Nick Gillespie, uh, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy pre Labor Day, comrades. Howdy. Hello, Matt. Happy Monday. We are going to uh, ring our joy bells about the Democratic National Convention that was took place last week in Chicago here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Lumen. Before we continue with the Reason Roundtable, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workouts, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried Lumen, and I've got to tell you that it is a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy, and it's fun to use. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. And for women, it can also track your cycle as well as the onset of menopause. And then it adjusts your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts. So you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash roundtable to get 15% off your lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E slash roundtable, and you'll get 15% off your purchase. Okay, last uh, week in the great and not particularly greatly governed city of Chicago, Democrats held their quadrennial presidential nominating convention. And in case you didn't have a name for those inside out style emotions that were welling up inside of you, it was joy. Also, in a surprise twist, uh, freedom. Democrats have now rebranded, however improbably, as the party of freedom, or in the words of uh, Vice Presidential Pick, Minnesota Governor, and uh, COVID authoritarian Tim Walls, minding your own damn business, uh, which sounds great to me. Uh, I wonder if there's any catch to that. Uh, by freedom, the party of Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren uh, mostly meant the freedom to control one's reproductive decisions the uh, possibility of marrying whatever non-relative adult you choose to and to have unfettered access to most books in school libraries, maybe not, uh, and cultures. Inside the <laughs> United Arena, where I spent most of the time, uh, the joy was palpable, um, mm -hmm. especially after the old guy, <laughs> old man president, Joseph Robinette Biden II, was ushered gently off stage after a barky speech on Monday night. Um, Democrats, for sure, feel relief that they no longer have to pretend that he's a particularly good candidate or that he's sharp as a tack. Uh, and now, after having uh, bathed in the holy speechifying glow of Oprah Winfrey and Barack and Michelle Obama, they are now trying to convince the rest of us that their relief is our joy. Uh, meanwhile, um, though the uh, betting markets, they have this race at a push. It's dead even, according to Poly Market, even a little Trump ahead, 50 to 49. Uh, uh, Kamala Harris is up 1.5 uh, points in the national polling averages, but in the battleground states, it's about half and half with uh, Kamala taking the North and Trump taking the South. Uh, so Catherine, um, mm. at these events uh, now more than ever, there's no news at all. And they're basically uh, infomer infomercials designed for the viewing audience at home. That means you. Uh, so what did you, uh, oh, uh, libertarian person, uh, see? What did you feel and what did you learn? 
I uh, saw the silent presence of ChatGPT in so many of those speeches, like every single one of them could have been, and I think many of them likely were written either by or with the assistance of AI. And I look forward to the expose on that, uh, that will come someday in the distant future. Uh, they were so generic. They were so bland. It really was, um, you know, message discipline on display. I don't know why I do this every year, but uh, I do feel this like weird sacred obligation to tune in at like 6 p.m. and watch every single lieutenant governor say, and in conclusion, fight for Kamala. And it's just horrific every time. But there's something that feels like I've done it before and I have to keep doing it in order to keep my baseline the same for my cynicism survey. Um, so, yes, the triumph of AI. And then, as you mentioned, uh, the freedom messaging, which um, I think we can talk about a little bit more. But I feel like uh, Isaiah Berlin was just rolling in his grave as we wildly conflated freedom from and freedom to um, no regard at all for the fact that they were, in fact, incompatible. Um, and um it was sad because I was like, oh, look, someone's talking about freedom. And then it was like, th they mean, they mean not at all what I mean by it, unfortunately. Freedom to the right to housing, as uh, uh, Tim Walls said. Do not about. feel sad about <laughs> Donald Trump. Freedom to have your abortions paid for by nuns. I mean, it was just a lot, a lot on that front. Uh, Peter, um, as a nun abortionist. No, that's not a really <laughs> yeah. good uh, transition. So, um, but as no, someone who pays attention to uh, economics. You got to stop doing transitions like that with the nuns in particular. It's just a bad habit. We're just going to pause. Uh, no, no, tell us a little bit about the. To that joke, which was, you know, it died in the womb. The... Oh, no. <laughs> I just hope it was a womb with a view. Uh, Peter, can you tell us about the freedom <laughs> content of of the economic messaging in particular. Yeah, it wasn't very freedom-y. There was a lot of it, like, you saw the word freedom all over, but that's what all you got here was you saw the word freedom. And there was, there was so little policy substance to this, and that was on purpose. You know, you asked Catherine, what did we learn? And I think the, the answer is, we didn't learn one damn thing. And that was, that was intentional. Because Democrats decided to run on hour after hour of pablum, of just like empty, like empty rhetoric, right? Em totally empty, shallow platitudes. And that was that was the choice that they explicitly made. There was not even like a, a pretense like, oh, no, there's actually a lot of substance here. No, they were like, you're going to vote for empty platitudes. You're going to vote for a, not very much substance. And so before the, the DNC. Uh, Kamala Harris gave uh, a long speech in North Carolina where she outlined an economic agenda, including things like $40 billion in loans to help spur on uh, building housing um, and $25,000 in federal uh, assistance for uh, certain qualified homeowners for down payments. And of course, there was the, the price gouging uh, bans, which may or may not be price controls. And I say may or may not. Because we don't know, but also the Harris team doesn't know. They're not telling us. They're not putting out the details and they're letting people argue about it because they don't care. They don't care one way or another what the actual policy is. They just want to be seen as, oh, you know, we're for affordability. We're for helping people own houses. We're for, they don't actually want to do the thing. They don't care about what the substance or what any of the details are. Uh, they just want to be seen saying these words that they think will help them win the election. And that is what we learned. That is like all we learned is they don't care and they don't expect us to care. And frankly, they may be right. Mo maybe most people just don't care. LOL, eat at Arby's. Um, uh, Nick, uh, building on that. Um, so if there's not really policy there, but they're using words that we like. Yeah. We like the word freedom. That's a good yeah. aspiration. I love the there. word freedom. And I think it's great for libertarians that people are, you know, if one of the parties is talking about freedom uh, rather than mass deportation, uh, we can have a conversation. We can elaborate on what freedom actually is versus what was being sold at the DNC. You know. I would say what I learned, uh, the big takeaway from me was that this was not the shit show that virtually everybody expected. Um, and not only was it actually really well, uh, I, I won't say it was well produced because it ran over time 
And, you know, if I can jump to my highlight of this was the fact that James Taylor was bumped off his <laughs> appearance on, on the uh, first night because it got too late and he had to go to sleep. It was, you know, nine or 10 o'clock at night. Um, but so that was great. But more, more importantly, there was a pivot to the center or maybe not a pivot, but like at least looking towards that, you did not see pro-Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, protests from the stage. You barely saw them from outside. Uh, you saw, um, you know, a uh, this was not drag time story hour, you know, on, on glorious display or anything like that. What you saw the Democrats talking a lot about was um, the freedom to live within a wide range of lifestyles, uh, which I actually I found comforting after some aspects of the Republican Party, which seemed to be pushing a kind of norm core, like to the extent that you move away from J.D. Vance as the platonic ideal of a man, you know, you are somehow anti-American. Um, so I, you know, I thought it was interesting to see that the Democrats are look towards the center. Somebody like Oprah gave a terrible speech, but it was directed towards people who were not already voting Democratic, which was kind of interesting to think about. The fact that it was accusatory and just saying like, you know, vote for us because we're not as bad as the other people is a, is a huge mistake. And I think it belies where what they really care about. But what I learned was that uh, Democrats can occupy a center if the Republican Party runs screaming away from them. So there's a been so, some, a, a joke going around about how uh, Kamala Harris, after uh, taking the lead spot on the ticket, Kamala Harris appears to be running something like a, a generic Democrat in terms of the polls. But I think what we saw at the DNC was that Kamala Harris is also very determined to just run as a generic Democrat, as as somebody who has no defining characteristics outside of being a perfectly placed avatar uh, of the party and what it stands for now, or at least what it wants to be seen as standing for in order to win elections. So the view from the uh, inside, I like Catherine, uh, all love to watch the undercard speeches because mm -hmm. they kind of give you a sense of what is the message discipline going to look like? What what thing are they going to hit over and over today or the, during the entire week? Uh, because Democrats are much more um, uh, uh, heavy on the edit button than Republicans are at their convention. Um, so, and, and also who is delivering that, right? Well, who, who wins the prize to get on stage even at six o'clock um, and who doesn't? And there's an interesting gap between all of that, which is to say that um, the, uh, uh, the people that were selected, especially on the first day, but all throughout, um, and this is kind of uh, underreported in the storylines about this because I think most people don't pay attention to that and it kind of makes them feel, oh, it was unions. This was a union 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 convention uh the first day i think there was heads of six different unions beginning with the one that has too many letters but it's about uh, a state and public uh, employees me. starts with an a Ask thank you me. um i see right like you make it smaller even like the I duck, use a right? too long ask me that's a flack yes that's a and, that's uh, and th so they went up and it wasn't just like uh there's a bunch of union heavies talking in union accents um, but like they would all shout out their special like code word that the people on the floor would then shout back at them and their slogans. Yeah. Um, it was just super duper heavy as were the choice of the other like politicians who would get on stage. Catherine, you mentioned Lieutenant governors. There was also some governors. Um, and these people were hacks. Kathy Hochul. Oh yeah. She's the <laughs> best. James Taylor. Like yeah. you know, someone who like no one will affirmatively choose someone who had a trouble winning the uh, governorship, rewinning the governorship in New York uh, over uh, a very Trumpy opponent um, uh, was given a really, really boring uh, stage time. And uh, pursuant to uh, 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 Peter's point that, uh, you know, it, they just didn't care. They don't really care whether about the policy stuff. So many of the, the choices of people up there were people who behaved in quasi villainous fashion, especially during COVID. Um, the last night on Thursday during the, the little uh, undercard hour, it was Randy Weingarten and Becky Pringle, the heads of the two largest teachers unions in the country, given, uh, you know, pretty prime uh, speaking slots. So you have this contrast, these hacks, these these people who aren't helping, who are doing the grubby work of politics in a way that makes your life worse in many cases. And then you have this overriding 
you know, a headline kind of joy of uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey, who I thought actually uh, I rated higher than um, than Nick did. But uh, Obama's as well, in which um, they portrayed themselves as, uh, yeah, you know, they're the party of Little League and freedom and God and, and USA. And, and I do kind of like that sort of rhetorical uh, nuge in that direction. But what they're trying to do more than anything else is to run an Obama campaign with Kamala Harris. <laughs> like like well, Obama, Barack uh, Obama in his speech, which I thought was very, very good. It reminded you of the mm -hmm. things that one can like about Barack Obama, even though usually I think his uh, speech is, giving is overrated when it has to do with policy. But that Obama, that one there saying, you know, talk nicely to your, your old folks. We don't have a monopoly on truth and whatever. Like all of those notes that he hit uh, were pretty great. And then the next day, almost every speech said the same thing. It was as if uh, Obama... Um, was editing those speeches as much as AI was. And in fact, um, a lot of the senior brain trusts of the Harris campaign, which is this Frankenstein monster, uh, you know, if there's some Biden people here, there's some Harris, there, but it's Obama. Uh, this is Barack Obama's party right now. And so they want to make you all feel this joy message because they remember how great that worked for Obama. But in the middle of it, you have this cipher, this cipher prosecutor who who bragged about prosecuting Backpage in, in her overly ballyhooed speech. Um, I think it's going to be a, a tension there. Can they uh, run out the clock on 73 days or whatever it is, um, making you think that there's a charismatic, interesting or a tour uh, in the middle of this party. And I'm not really sure that there is one. Um, you know, Catherine, along with the joy, which was forced, right? Because yeah. if, if you constantly are having to say, hey, we're, you know, we're having a lot of joy here, aren't we? You obviously are not. I mean, um, like the other phrase is like, we're making memories. You're like, okay. Yeah. It, I mean, it definitely had that feel to it. Um, and um, the other phrase that kept coming back and they had to force this was, we're not going back. Yes. And I wish that they had done a better job of explaining from what to what and things like that. Obviously, that is tied into abortion rights and things like that. But, um, you know, that was another thing where this definitely had a, the, the back and forth, the call and response so forced. It reminded me of being in kindergarten and in early grammar school, where it's like the teachers were watching who was who was participating, who wasn't, and you were going to get in trouble after the assembly if you were not vociferous enough. Well, Catherine, the text uh, of that, I think, is that we're not going back to Donald Trump, but the implication is maybe we're also not going back to Joe Biden. I really like Ooh. the idea that, um, you know, we're running, uh, Kamala Harris is essentially running against the incumbent who is Donald Trump, except he's not no. an incumbent. Oh, like, yeah. What Amazing. an outsider, right? the sitting yeah. vice president. Yeah. Is. Where has she been? Why were, you know, it's it's a great to have her parachute in now. She's, you know, because it's she doesn't have anything to do with the past four years. Uh, Catherine, um, you're a lady. Uh, a lot of the undercard discussion, especially the kind of the, the normals who were put on stage to talk about their experiences, a huge number of them had something to do with a big reproductive decision and how that was either hampered by what's happened to state level policies since the uh, abolition of or overturning of Roe versus Wade or that could have been threatened if a Trump Vance universe uh, came in. I know uh, with interest that over the weekend or over the last four days, let's say, both Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have been backpedaling pretty furiously on abortion. Uh, I think Trump said that we're, we're the Trump White House is going to be great for reproductive rights, yeah. um, us, using that language in particular, and J.D. Vance saying that Trump would veto uh, uh, any kind of a, a, a abortion ban. What do you make of all of that? I guess I take it for good news broadly. Um, I, I did find that um, the place where the freedom messaging was most resonant was on abortion issues um, and, and to a lesser extent on gay rights. Um, I think that's j mostly just because that isn't really at issue right now. It's not really a, a live conversation, but um, I think that's the other place Democrats have a legitimate claim to be uh, purveyors of freedom in, in the um, sense that we would recognize it. The abortion programming, I thought, was really, really well done. Um, and it's actually sort of interesting to me that it took so long to get to this messaging um, on the part of uh, of pro-choice activists, right? Having the um, 
you know, tr the tragic medically necessary abortion or abortion care for um, people who really, really want kids is a very obvious place to go for sympathy. Um, having that that one young woman um, talk about, um, you know, being um, sexually assaulted at I think she was 12 or something horrible. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, to my mind, where a lot of this rhetoric should have been all along and you have to do the radical stuff too. You have to, you know, you have to fight about partial birth abortion and all that, but um, very, very effective, I thought. And just a very clear case for individual freedoms. I will say though, the democratic party does not have at the federal level, a clear path forward in terms of policy. So this is another place where it sort of felt like there was a little more substance there, but in fact, it's not clear what President Kamala Harris would do. I mean, the stuff on the edges that every president does when it toggles back and forth, right? We're funding or not funding, you know, abortions as part of overseas aid. We're funding or not funding Planned Parenthood. We're not, and you know, we can disagree about those things, but um, unless, you know, there's a landslide, Harris is simply not going to be in a position to do anything legislatively. And, um, and so there is still this, there's just still this gap. It's just still like, so what are you going to actually do? And that question is not answered. But I thought at least the freedom rhetoric matched with the pro-choice rhetoric. Peter, I was struck by, um, uh, once again, the teachers union heaviness of the convention, not only in selecting those uh, two uh, union heads on the Thursday, but also just the mayor of Chicago, uh, Brandon Johnson, is a, a product of the Chicago Teachers Union, which is one of the most notorious um, unions in the country. Um, you'll recall that they um, uh, accused people who wanted to reopen schools of being rooted in white supremacy or whatever, like absolute nonsense uh, that was. You have written a lot about the uh, tangible uh, impact of unionism on public policy. Uh, what do you see with the modern contemporary Democratic Party? How might their pro-unionism translate into specific policies? And are those policies great for the United States of America? Yeah, the answer is those policies are not great, whatever they are. And the way that those policies are going to, the way that that pro-unionism is going to translate into policy is sometimes it's going to be special exceptions for unions. We saw that all over the pandemic where the unions basically just said, we're special, we're different, and we want different treatment. And they got it, especially teachers unions, but uh, all over the public sector union uh, bureaucracy. Even, and then even the, private, I'll, I'll interject because Reason's done great coverage of yeah. this. They had the guy up who lobbied successfully to get private pensions bailed out by the government in a COVID relief bill, which is kind of apropos of nothing having to do with COVID relief. Go on. Sorry. And no, no, that's a very good point. And then relatedly, I think you will just you will also see that not just in the exceptions for unionized workers, especially in the public sector, you will also see spending and uh, quasi spending tax carve outs, tax incentives, that sort of thing. But we we saw that all throughout COVID as well, where the teachers unions were big drivers of some of those early spending bills but, uh, under Trump as well. But then um, also under President Biden, where there were just giant pots of money that basically were there for school for teachers unions and supposedly they were there for emergency reasons to help with say ventilation or just whatever the costs of operating a school were during the pandemic but then in so many cases they got that money and they didn't make any ventilation improvements but they also didn't operate the schools the schools just stays stayed closed for in-person uh, learning and that has been devastating and so the democratic party right now is in hock to unions that are making things more expensive all over for everyone, um, but also specifically just in like a, a witch's, you know, thrall to the teachers unions, which uh, which kept schools closed throughout COVID, which uh, have inflicted more damage on America's school children than basically any other institutional, like nameable group that has any kind of real power in the United States. And the Democratic Party said, they're the heroes. They're the ones we are going to bend over backwards to serve their needs and their wishes and just do whatever they want. And that was a big part of the message of the of the whole week of the whole Democratic convention. I think that was we've seen that throughout the Biden administration. But Harris is making clear that she is going to double down on that. And let's not forget that um, the first night, especially, um, but uh, throughout the convention, 
uh, Democrats said uh, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris um, uh, reopened the schools, um, that Trump botched the uh, the COVID response, but uh, Joe Biden fixed it. Um, do you feel fixed is one question. All right. Uh, another big national story that happened last week. I feel spayed and neutered, Matt. Politics feel... can't Thank fix you. Can't fix us, Matt. Politics cannot fix us. Um, thank you That's for not what alcohol is putting for. a pun at the end of that sentence. Uh, RFK Jr., uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the bear handler, <laughs> the, the whale head transporter. Yeah. Uh, just shout the out to all of you. Kill, awesome. The roadkill road deep like, freezer operator. Uh, the the drug Nick, dealer, let, let, no, no. although that was Let kind Matt of a low cook blow here, Matt. Give us a little more. Give us a little more of a shout out to the RFK Junior fans okay, who cool. listen to this podcast because they Jr. totally fans, exist. They wrote us a lot of letters. Spot on. Uh, the guy who wanted a death penalty, a corporate death penalty, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, because they allegedly were uh, insufficiently enthusiastic about global warming re regulations. Um, yeah, he's our free speech champion. It's just so sad to see what happened to RFK uh, Jr. Uh, anyways, he dropped out of the race, kind of, on Friday, even though he's going to be on the ballot in some places. Um, gave a uh, weird speech um, with Donald Trump on stage on Friday in uh, Arizona uh, somewhere. Redundant. He's endorsing Donald Trump. He's now uh, pushing Maha, <laughs> which is Make America Healthy Again. Because yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Um, this uh, abdication came after serial legal harassment by Democrats who kept suing to get him off ballots in, in crappy states like New York with their ballot access laws uh, over residency requirements. And granted, his whatever he's filling out on his applications doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to reality. Um, but uh, this was making his... Uh, campaign a lot more expensive than it otherwise would have been. And since it was funded by his vice presidential candidate, uh, at some point she probably decided wanted to stop losing money. Um, so uh, if this happened three months ago, it probably would have helped uh, Democrats because back then there were still a lot of voters who were uh, on the fence about supporting Joe Biden on account of he's super old and uh, can't get on and off the stage without being physically handled. Um, but uh, Harris, Kamala Harris, brought in uh, many of those voters uh, after she entered the race and RFK's numbers started going uh, far down. And so now the idea is that the people who were still voting for him um, were uh, decidedly more uh, Trumpy and uh, more MAGA. So this might give a small bump to Trump, although we don't really know yet. Nick, um, what does this yeah. news tell us, if anything, about the state of third party and independent uh, presidential challenges? I think first and foremost, it shows that America is not ready for a direct message about the uh, the health negative aspects of seed oils, Matt. I think you're uh, right. because he spent a, most of his uh, withdrawal speech was actually talking about how unhealthy Americans were. And of course, he brought up seed oils um, and the idea that you are going to say we need to stop eating you know, machine, factory produced seed oil. And so I'm putting my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling my voters to go with Donald Trump, a guy who only eats plastic food. I mean, this is a guy who had <laughs> national championship winning teams come over and he's like, here's some McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. I mean, this is like, we're, we're way the most beyond relatable Philip he's K. ever Dick. been. Yeah. The way beyond Philip K. Dick universe at this point. Um, it, but there's a couple things. One is that his, his speech showcases why RFK Jr. was losing support, which is the more he talks, the more people realize that he's, if not absolutely delusional, is just a bullshit artist. At one point in his talk, which I listened to, he said, one of every three kids is diabetic or pre-diabetic. So I looked that up, right? Uh, and that means like type two diabetes. We're talking about the number, one of every three kids is diabetic or pre-diabetic, 0.35 of 1% of kids under 20 are diabetic. So it's like he just is, you know, his his head is a buzz of facts and half facts and mashups. That's why he was losing popularity. Having said that, it is absolutely grotesque the way that New York State and all other places tried to push him off the ballot. And we need to fight against all of that kind of stuff. And I think we also need to understand why was RFK you know, the 70-year-old effectively ne'er-do-well, you know, couch surfing 
scion of a once famous political family in America. Why was he so appealing versus Biden and Trump? And it's because he was speaking to something outside of, you know, the establishment or whatever. And, um, you know, that that urge, that need to get beyond what the Democrats and the Republicans are trying to stuff down our throat, like so much seed oil processed curly fries from Arby's is still out there. And I think as, you know, just as a coda to this, the real winner of him dropping out, hopefully is Chase Oliver of the Libertarian Party, because he is actually offering something that represents a different dynamic than the spectrum, you know, clustered in the middle of the football field by, uh, you know, Kamala Harris and, uh, and Donald Trump. Peter, um, uh, the, uh, grotesque political hack, uh, Rick Wilson of the Lincoln project, uh, coined a phrase, I think in 2016 or 17, uh, about how everything Trump touches dies. It's memorable. And there's some plausibility to it. Um, when you look at like his effect on, on bodies, like the house freedom caucus, for example. Um, but I'm wondering about a flip side that I would like you to entertain, which is that, you know, Trump didn't necessarily touch, the Kennedy campaign, uh, they didn't like reach out too much and touch the uh, Libertarian Party, um, uh, which invited him to speak at their convention. I'm sure there was some discussion, but it was more like from their point of view, they look at Trump. Um, and this is not Chase Oliver. This is more the management of the Libertarian Party that I'm referring to. Um, they look at a Donald Trump and they see the world's greatest shortcut. Like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, the famous guy who's funny and in control um, uh, uh, people in, and kind of upend politics, which he totally has. Um, that is a shortcut to the thing that we want. And so therefore they lose patience for doing the long, slow slog about, uh, building new parties or building up coalitions. What do you think about that analysis, Peter Suderman? I basically agree with that. I think the best way to understand the RFK campaign and some of what's gone on in the capital L Libertarian Party uh, is just to think of this as like a, a an outsider cohort of podcast land weirdos. These folks are like, this is the Joe Rogan corner of the political universe. This is, uh, in some cases, the Tucker Carlson corner of the pol political universe. And while those guys might be left or right coded uh, individually, like they, they overlap an awful lot. And the issue is for someone like RFK is because you are a podcast land weirdo, a sort of a conspiracy theorist who is also obsessed with free speech and foreign intervention and all of that stuff. And you appeal to those, to that sort of in some cases, paranoid mind, but at least a, uh, to people who are very distrustful of institutional authority. The problem for someone like that is that Donald Trump already does a much better job of appealing to those same folks. And so there was never really, in my, to my mind, like a a runway for someone like RFK, and this has, I think, also been an issue for the Libertarian Party, um, is that Trump is just so much more successful as that genuine sort of, yes, he was president, but he's an outsider, a weirdo. He is disliked by the establishment. He is the candidate of people who distrust institutional authority. He is channeling that distrust into something that benefits him and mostly just him. There are, of course, people riding his coattails, but this is mostly about him. And so, uh, you know, in some ways, in some ways, he's a shortcut, but in other ways, he's going to destroy the thing that is trying to ride off of the Trump phenomenon. RFK is going to sort of kind of maybe drop out and endorse Trump sort of kind of maybe because because Trump is better at doing the thing that RFK was trying to do. The capital LP, uh, or at least parts of it that were, you know, uh, that have taken control in in recent years, they are going to struggle and um, and have internal issues because it, ultimately Trump is is a better sort of outsider um, discon candidate of uh, of discontent and distrust. And so you see Trump just squashing all of those little tiny movements uh, that might, without Trump in the race, have you know ha have become focus points for that that group of people who just looks at all institutional authorities, the two party system. Yes, of course, which ironically Trump is, has, has taken control of one of those parties. Right. But all, all, basically all institutional authorities, all kind of like, um, knowledge production, uh, 
uh, institutions, academia, journalism, all of that. And Trump is just gathering all the folks who who don't like those institutions, who don't trust them, and and putting and, and giving them a big tent to 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 get under. Catherine, um, do you want to give a uh, uh, not final but sort of valedictory, I guess, uh, shout out to all those people who sent you emails over the years saying that we were insufficiently enthusiastic about the libertarian bona fides of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I want to say, suck it. But in other ways, I want to say that they were right. Uh, so I'll I will go with the more charitable approach, um, which is uh, which is kind of what Peter was saying that, um, you know, there is this he was just the latest avatar of this very sincere, very real desire to have something that is just not this, not these two major parties and the whole double hater phenomenon, which I was very excited about which has evaporated in the face of Kamala Harris's ascendancy. Wait, wait, uh, that the double hater phenomenon is alive and well on this podcast. On this podcast, but in the in the polling, the double haters yeah. disappeared. Um, and, uh, you know, there are fair weather double haters uh, because there's still so much to double hate. And um, these are the same people who would say in the past, um, well, I'd like to vote for Ron Paul, but if I can't, maybe um, then I'll vote for Dennis Kucinich. Or uh, if I, you know, uh, I like the Libertarian Party, but I also like Bernie Sanders. Uh, RFK is a part of that phenomenon. And uh, I think what Peter said is right, which is that Trump scooped up all those people. The sort of Democratic slander on him that he is weird um, is... Uh, is a selling point for lots and lots of people. I mean, including people who previously would have been associated with the left, right? We keep Austin weird and that's good, but the, you know, suddenly JD Vance is weird and it's bad. Um, of course, there's lots to unpack there, but I think this, this deep, deep, deep desire to just have not these two mainstream parties is something that we want to encourage. It's, you know, it is the place where we live. Um, it's non-ideological. And I think that's something that's hard for us ideologues to understand. These people's, the content isn't super important. It's about being in opposition to this other thing. For now, Trump has scooped it up. I think in the post-Trump era, there's going to be an interesting new moment, a new moment of possibility for all the weirds to form a new coalition. And maybe this time, this time, it will be libertarian. Well, if Very I'm hopeful that there's going to be a post-Trump era. There's, you know, a big issue here, though, is that RFK and Trump in their own ways and weirdly the Libertarian Party under the Mises Caucus, they are, you know, they say they're anti-establishment or they're counter to the center, but all they want to do is occupy that and cram stuff down people's throats. That's what Trump does. And it really matters to Trump that he went to Penn. If Trump had gone to Ramapo Mountain College or something like that, he, you know, it would be a different thing. What Ron Paul brought that I think was very distinct uh, and to a, a very good degree, uh, Gary Johnson did this too, was which was not some kind of weird, uh, uh, you know, uh, situation where you have to be part of the establishment in order to matter or anything like that. And that RFK was doing that. If his name was, you know, Robert F., you know, Coates, nobody would have given a shit. And he knew that. And he has to keep trotting out all of, you know, the fact that he is central to the vision of America, you know, that we all believe in and things like that. And that's what I hope uh, the haters within, I think, a broad uh, uh, range of libertarians, but also, you know, the people who followed Dennis Kucinich or others, um, you know, what we need is something where it's like, hey, you know what? We don't give a shit about these old institutions that are dying. And it doesn't mean we can't learn from them, but we are not going to spend our lives either dominating them and becoming them or talking about how they're cheating us. We're going to build our own. And um, that's why RFK Jr. really, I don't think, could get very far. He has to live in proximity to the, you know, to Camelot, uh, every bit as much as Trump. And in that sense, it's not a real alternative. I will put in just one final uh, note, right. which is I think if RFK does get a cabinet spot, which is, I guess, the mm -hmm. current discussion, we will see him embody all the things that are the least libertarian about himself. Like that, that is the most likely outcome is that he will he will if he actually acquired some power, it will be used in the service of uh, very, very unlibertarian ends, just as Trump himself, um, many libertarians excited about him early on 
found that once he gained power, he focused largely on using that power for unlibertarian ends. Uh, that's uh, been memory hold mostly, but there's a lot of reporting in the fall of 2008 um, during the uh, Obama uh, transition team era that he was going to be up for a possible cabinet position. Um, I don't know if it was Health and Human Services or Department mm -hmm. of Interior, but something along those lines. Um, uh, maybe and, President. Uh, and then that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that evaporated that for on stage always without a shirt on, like no matter what the uh, circumstances. And Kamala Harris is like, it's okay, give us ten. It's the Jack Parr of uh, American politics. All right, we're gonna get to our uh, email of the week here in a moment, but first. A reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, do you ever feel like you need to get something off your chest, like guilt over living thousands of miles away from your extended family during a period of intense suffering? Irritation at being exposed in your workplace to hazardous chemicals, including but not limited to political rhetoric? Uh, annoyance that absolutely positively no one in your household can unload or load a dishwasher correctly? Well, it's time to uncork those emotions, uh, perhaps with a licensed professional who can help you break down your burdens into more bite-sized chunks. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super-flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast do the necessary release work in order to more smoothly get through their day. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a the therapist, and if you don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right, reminder, please send your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Dustin James Harper. That is his real name. Who writes, greetings, roundtable. Governor Spencer Cox, quick name that state. Uh, recently announced a lawsuit against the federal government over control of a subset of federally controlled land in Utah. And uh, uh, the Dustin James Harper character uh, sent us helpfully a little uh, link showing that. If you, if you, Roundtable, lived in Utah, how would you feel about this? I have to specify if you lived in Utah, because the whole premise of the lawsuit is that if you don't live in Utah, it shouldn't be any of your business what we do with our land here. Catherine, what say you? I feel great about this. I think this is long overdue. Reason has covered this uh, in many forms over many years. Uh, it is absolutely flatly insane that the federal government owns 70 percent of Utah. Like there's so much Utah. It's just enormous. And the federal government owns almost all of it in a way that makes no sense at all. Um, it's also a very uh, reasonable proposal. Uh, you know, you do see from time to time these sort of radical rebellions. We're going to, you know, shoot up the Bureau of Land Management Office and take it back by force. That's not a good idea. Um, this proposal sets aside all the national parks, all the military bases and all the um, uh, native reservations. Anything that could possibly be controversial is like, fine, we're not even talking about that. We're just talking about the enormous, enormous amount of our state that is owned by the feds for no reason at all. And uh, just on the face of it, you should you should support this. You should you should say, hey, maybe the people who live on or near that land should control it. That's an idea. Um, so I I uh, were I a Utahan, which I am not um, and probably never will be. I certainly would support this proposal. It seems like they are going about it in a reasonable and responsible way. And um, I'll be very interested to see if ultimately, I mean, I assume this goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, I will be very interested to see if the court agrees with my shouty reasoning. Uh, Nick, having uh, driven over this past week uh, through uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania twice, mm -hmm. I think a little Indiana in there. Uh, a touch uh, you would Indiana have. Uh, and the fact that you don't remember is a tribute to Indiana's unique qualities. Uh, you can't miss the smell of Gary, Indiana. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. In any case. Uh, but uh, the snap thought just occurred to me and since you uh, lived in at least one of those states, um, which I've is... actually lived in two of those states. Manuel. See, there you go. Uh, Hillbilly Gillespie elegy. Uh, oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, the, uh, they called me. 
people on the East Coast don't really realize how uh, everywhere in America from the Rockies <laughs> westward are, are owned by the government, the federal government. I mean, it's just look yeah. at look at like Nevada, Arizona. It's crazy. Uh, most of the East uh, side of the Mississippi River is not. Um, and yet that's also still not very uh, heavily inhabited, let's say. Um, do you think that basically the feds are holding on to the West because if they actually let it go, no one would live uh, in the East Coast or the Midwest ever again? No, I don't think so at all. There's a reason, despite all of this, that the majority of Americans don't live in the middle of nowhere with no services and horrible climate that even rattlesnakes move from when they get the chance back <laughs> <laughs> Having said all of that, this, uh, you know, what we're talking about here is the latest kind of skirmish in the old sagebrush rebellion, which, as Catherine pointed out, reason has been covering since probably, I, I don't know, you know, since 1968 or shortly thereafter. And I recommend people to uh, 1995 coverage by Carl Hess Jr., who's the son of Carl Hess, the speechwriter for Barry Goldwater and, the you know, just insane, wonderful, rad, uh, radical in American politics. And Carl Hess Jr. Uh, wrote a, a piece called Storm Over the Rockies that we'll drop in the show notes. But this has been a problem really for well over a century. And, uh, you know, if you believe in local control and that the people closest to an area really are going to do better with it, what is being proposed in Utah, and there was a law passed in 2012 about this, all of this should have been done a long time ago. And it's kind of good to see Utah and other Western states and people pushing this in a way that is not going to get roped into the whole Clive and Bundy scandal, you know, from a few years ago and things like that, which is also on the periphery of this issue. Um, you know, this to me, the, the fact of this is one more thing, kind of like the challenging of occupational licensing laws and things like zoning laws of technologies of kind of governance that were put into place a hundred or more years ago where people are just like, okay, forget it. This, this does not work anymore. And we really need new models for stuff. So I think the Utah law sounds great and I hope that it succeeds and I hope it changes things so that the West will be better governed. You know, Gary Johnson as governor of New Mexico talked about this all the time, you know, yep. the, the state of New Mexico and the most importantly, the individuals living there own virtually none of the state. And it means that you can't really be a good steward if, if it's not your property. Uh, Peter, what say you, uh, U.S. out of Utah? Oh, yeah. Look, this is a hard question for me to respond to in a bunch of ways, but namely, like it, it asks me what I would do if I lived in Utah. And not only do I not live in Utah, it's hard for me to imagine that I ever would live in Utah. Right. So like that, that may just be a, a gap too far here. No, I, I, I agree with everything that Catherine and Nick said. The U.S. federal government owns far too much land out in the West and the onus should be on the federal government to demonstrate a very clear, very particular, specific, immediate need if they're going to own land out there. And that's just not the case for the vast majority of the land that they own. Uh, Peter, if your objection is to Mormon influence drinking laws, I recommend moving to Price, Utah, which has a very colorful history of uh, labor unrest towards the Mormon majority. And there is at there. least one very good distillery. The, they were an NDP, a non-distiller producer for a very long time called High West out there. They make um, some really great blends, uh, have done a lot with um, picking up basically bottles of, of whiskey from other big producers, picking the best ones and then finishing them in interesting ways. And it's just a sort of interesting lesson in like the value add of the production chain. It's not just that they are buying other stuff and blending it. They're also finishing it and sort of creating a new product out of something that other people have made first. Um, all right, we're going to get to a lightning round of a topic that frankly just confuses me, but a lot of people are talking about it. And I know that we have smart people on this podcast, in addition to the person playing point guard. So I'm just going to throw this first to Nick. Uh, Pavel Durov, if that's his, his real name, was arrested in France. Uh, he's the head of Telegram, which is, I believe, a Russian owned or influenced no. uh, social media company. No, he's no, that's how he was. Off. He was in Russia and founded it there with his brother and left uh, Russia. Okay. He's -Russia, but Tell me what happened, because on the face of it, it looks like, well, that's pretty bad uh, arresting people for being social media company owners. And this seems like a one of those European uh, kind of dystopian 
uh, moves towards free speech. Uh, maybe you have a more nuanced and fact holding point of view about those events. Uh, so uh, I, does anybody here use Telegram? Uh, you know, this, to my mind, it's one of those like annoyingly endlessly proliferating end-to-end -end encryption apps that your latest friend tells you this is the only way we can communicate. Um, but um, Telegram is, is a good app that has been dinged by French authorities and it's been under attack from a lot of other governments for um, not moderating its content as well and working with authorities to stamp out things like misinformation and child pornography, terrorism, every you know negative behavior that you can imagine that gets lobbed against all of these platforms all the time. Uh, the founder also had created what became uh, Russia's version of Facebook, and he left the country when Putin was demanding that he turn over a lot of information from that to the government. So um, this, I think very much, Matt, the way that you you kind of framed it, which is like, this is has a lot to do with the difference between the way that European countries and the EU more broadly think about freedom of unregulated speech, of permissionless speech or not. Um, and this is disturbing in and of itself because it reminds us that you know, people who create places, you know, like Gutenberg did, where you can suddenly start circulating information or knowledge or having your say without government approval, they are always going to be threats to the uh, the establishment. And, you know, we think that we're, we are beyond that. Um, and we look at, you know, countries like China that take major uh, tech innovators and put them into captivity as somewhere, somewhere backward. But when you look at this and when you look at some of the stuff from the Twitter files and whatnot in, in much attenuated form, you realize that the, uh, you know, the government, uh, the corporations that heavily influence the government um, actually have quite a deal of power. And I hope this works out. I hope that he does not end up becoming, uh, you know, a kind of a multiverse iteration of somebody like Julian Assange who gets into trouble for a lot, you know, for holding space for people to converse and to discuss and to share information, some of it ugly, perhaps some of it even criminal, but you know, that, that he is not punished for, a, it, you know, massively expanding the uh, sphere of free speech. Uh, Peter, do you have a quick thought and you don't have to have one? This is a guy who has talked about how he prioritizes freedom in all aspects of life, in particular, um, freedom of speech, freedom, free markets, and freedom of movement. And I think that is built into Telegram. Telegram is a, a, a service, a program that allows people to do stuff outside the watchful eyes of the government, of governments. Um, and, this, and you can see how someone who came from Russia would want to build something like that. But other governments, even Western governments that we consider, we sort of think of as, oh, you know, basically in favor of freedom, of sort of letting people do what they want. They don't like it when people do stuff outside of the where they can't see it and in ways designed to to mask what they are doing from uh, from authorities. And of course, whenever you create something like that, it is going to be used in some cases by people who want to do stuff that is illegal. But in a lot of cases, it's going to be used just by people who value their privacy and who want to do their business without the governments watching over, uh, butting in um, and uh, and making decisions for them. That's what Telegram is for. That's what it is. That's what it was designed for. And that is why he was arrested. And I think that that is a worrying trend in Western governments that we are seeing so much um, so much resistance to technologies that allow people to circumvent government control and government surveillance. Uh, Catherine, quick anti-French joke. <laughs> I mean, these goddamn frogs don't like free speech. It, this is crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say very briefly, like he's he's you know, banning platforms that allow people to do speech or assembly that uh, authorities don't like does not ultimately ban those people. It just spawns new platforms and it's telegram now, but it's always going to be something else. And um, it is not the fault of the platform that people are sometimes jerks and sometimes do illegal things. And the pretense that it is has taken us to terrible places, including this man's arrest. All right, uh, we're going to get to our uh, cultural uh, recommendations of the week in a microsecond. Uh, but first, there's been some legal developments in the uh, overdose uh, case of Friends star Matthew Perry. Nick, I understand you have some thoughts about that that you would like to share in a concise manner. 
Yeah, you know, Matthew Perry's family is su are, is suing the doctors who legally prescribed him ketamine for depression and other indications, um, despite the fact that, according to press reports, he was killed by ketamine that he bought on the streets. And, you know, this is worrying, particularly in the wake of the FDA declining to authorize uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for uh, PTSD and other things, uh, for the same reason that it is, you, you see in these types of cases, something that is happening that is new and helpful to many, many people, and then it gets roped down. It, get, you know, it gets taken down in a net of old drug war tropes that somehow doctors who prescribe something uh, you know, in accordance with the law and things like that are actually responsible when their patients or their clients do bad. I think all of us who have addicts in the family or addicts in our own history, addiction in our own history and things like that, know how hard it is for somebody to overcome those kinds of problems. And it's also equally true that it's hard for families to overcome their understanding of what causes this. Matthew Perry had access to the absolute highest level of care um, to beat his addictions and to live a meaningful life. That did not happen, and that's sad, and it's a tragedy. But if your response then is to start to try and sue out of existence a system that is going to and is already helping countless thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to beat the very same problem, something has gone wrong. And to the extent that this plays into a kind of second wave of drug war uh, offenses, offensives, after the beginning of the end of the drug war, which we've been seeing our entire lives, but especially in the 21st century, that just compounds a, a personal tragedy with a mass social one. That should just not be countenance. Well said. Thank you very much. Let's go to our end of show, uh, cultural recommendations in zippy fashion. Catherine, why don't you lead us by example? Matt, I saved a book from my vacation to talk about when you returned because it's uh, it's by a Czech writer whose name you will help me pronounce, uh, Bohumil Harabal. Harabal, yes. Harabal? He's the most beloved of Czech authors of the 20th century by a long shot incredibly weird, incredibly good book, Too Loud a Solitude. It's about a man who uh, has spent 35 years turning banned books and other waste paper into little compressed parcels, disposing of them, also while drinking a heroic quantity of beer, even for checks, is my that's understanding. Right. And that's really saying something. Um, it's giving my year of rest and relaxation from Otessa Mashvega in its weird intoxication. It's giving like the things I imagine Matt Welsh was up to in the 90s mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, various. And in Chicago. Yeah. And in Chicago last week. It is um, it's giving Fahrenheit 451, but uh, more nuanced, more weird, more hard to understand, but still the message is the same. And um, it's just, just an absolutely wild book. And then you find out there is a 17 minute uh, puppet and a <laughs> stop motion adaptation yeah. of this story voiced by Paul Giamatti. And I, I just, just need you to know that. I hope that that was done by Jan Schwankmeier, who's a, an expert at that particular uh, art, uh, also a great Czech. Hrabal, um, uh, impish little guy, never left uh, uh, Czechoslovakia during the battle days of communism. Um, he's uh, most famous for that book, which I think is his best, and also closely uh, observed or closely watched Trains, which was a, a very famous Czech New Wave film directed by Yuzhi Menzel, and I Served the King of England, which is what I recommend for you, Catherine, as the follow-up book to that, which is sort of talking about the uh, uh, the Czech experience during World War II. He's kind of a magical realist drunkard, um, yes. is probably the best way to describe Hrabal, and just like quintessentially Czech. He uh, would drink every day in the same pub right in the middle of Old Town called, I think, at the Golden Tiger, and every time there was a dignitary, including Bill Clinton, would come to town, um, uh, Václav Havel, the president then, would uh, would always drag them to sit down with Hraba at the pub. And it's not a pub that you could go to because the regulars were so, like, you know, they're worse than surfer locals only types, but uh, but he was just there every day. And then, um, for sadness, uh, go look uh, look up about how old uh, Bohemil died. 
Um, yeah. it's, a, it's not the greatest um, story, but it's also kind of poetical in his way. So thank you for saving that uh, for me, Catherine. Uh, speaking of saving it for me, Nick, uh, what mm. did you watch? <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of the Giamatti family. Uh, oh, yes. Wow. Ooh, yes. Wow. Uh, Paul so Giamatti. It's all coming Nate together. Father, uh, Bart uh, Giamatti uh, is the man who, of course, banned uh, Pete Rose from uh, Major League Baseball and effectively the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, I watched a fantastic documentary series on HBO called Charlie Hustle and the Matter of Pete Rose, which was directed by Mark Monroe. And uh, just as a first thing, I'll say what is good about this, among other things, is it breaks the streak of recent long form documentaries where the subject is the executive producer. Um, and if you care about baseball, that I, I don't need to say anything else, watch this, get an HBO Max or whatever they're calling in that subscription and watch this uh, four part series. But it is a stunning look at somebody who can lay claim to being the greatest baseball player of all time, or certainly one of them, one of the great figures in the game who was laid low by his own unbelievable stupidity and stubbornness, which is obviously clearly linked to his ability to set all sorts of records. I mean, he's called Charlie Hustle. Uh, he was mockingly called that by Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle in spring training one year where they were laughing at him as a near rookie or whatever. And the way that he would like, you know, r run the, to first base on a walk and things like that. Um, but that determination leads to his inability to kind of course correct and to admit his problems and to stick to it. And it is, uh, there's footage of him. He's in his early eighties now and this, most of this footage was sh uh, shot a few years ago to see a basically 80 year old man whose one dream is to be in the baseball hall of fame. Absolutely making sure that he will never be able to be in that other than a few artifacts that are already in there. Um, is stunning. It's a, it's a, it, whether you like baseball or not, seeing the way he talks to the interview and sticks to his story with certitude, regardless of how much it changes, uh, the cast of characters around him. It's a, uh, you know, it's just an American tragedy. It's something that Ring Lardner might have written about or Theodore Dreiser or something like that. It's, it's wonderful. And uh, I highly recommend it. And it is, a stunning look at exactly the same Midwestern milieu that has given us Tim Waltz and J.D. Vance. But this is the dark, seamy underside of excellence in the, middle, in, in the Midwest, to, to put a point on it, but also the just unbelievable lunk-headed stupidity of it all. Uh, P. Rose was uh, probably my favorite player growing up until uh, Bobby Gritch brought his uh, porn star mustache into my life. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and well, uh, Pete the, Rose is Batman, right? He's the superhero who got there by working hard. Exactly. He's not exactly a mutant that. and he's not from another planet. It's like he had no superpower other than, you know, uh, uh, as he repeats several times through this in different contexts, a willingness to walk through hell in a gasoline suit to play baseball. That um, that sense of uh, the absolute competitive monstrousness uh, is uh, something I love. I mean, uh, in sports, the Michael Jordan documentary yeah. uh, was pretty famous, and that one was executive produced by Michael Jordan. But you get it still, like, wow, what a monster of a human being uh, he was, and probably still is. I'm sure Kobe Bryant was in his way, mm -hmm. and other uh, other favorites. And it's just something to think about: the single-minded competitive monstrousness of athletes. Uh, is a lot this fatal flaw, and it's also super entertaining and uh, and and fun to examine. I look forward to seeing that, Nick Gillespie. Peter Suderman, what did you yeah. what did you consume? Yeah, well, I'm just sad I didn't consume that Paul Giamatti uh, puppet documentary or whatever. I think I'm going to have to check that one out. Does he shout? Uh, you know, because when Paul Giamatti plays foreigners, uh, and I'm thinking of. <laughs> It's either The Prestige or that other movie that's exactly like The Prestige uh, about the magician where he plays like a turn of the century Viennese cop. And this is uh, a question know, for Catherine. Because yeah, no, I, I, I mean, but like it. when he, he plays foreigners in old time movies, he just shouts all the time. It's he's, very strange. He's uh, no, it, it, it's less shouty, more uh, downtrodden, grumbly interiority. 
Oh, so sideways, Paul Giamatti. All right, mm -hmm. I'm really gonna have to check it out now. I um, uh, I watched Blink twice, the uh, debut film from Zoe Kravitz, who is yes, mm. the daughter of Lenny Kravitz, uh, a model and actress. She was in um. Uh, Fury Road, among other things. Uh, also, um, Kimmy, a surprisingly good Steven Soderbergh movie that debuted on um, HBO Max uh, only. It's a really quite one of the best pandemic films, like about the pandemic, about wearing masks and being kind of a shut in. Um, uh, this, sadly, is not one of the best movies I have ever seen. It is very much in the mold of Get Out and Don't Worry Darling and Antebellum, these sort of big twist horror films with a very blunt social message. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it, just in case you do want to see it, but basically it stars Channing Tatum as a billionaire who, when we first see him, he's on Instagram apologizing and promising to do better for, for we don't know what, for we don't know what. But then uh, we flash forward to he's uh, running a foundation and he's having a big gala and uh, one of the... the Two of the waitresses at the at, at the gala are like, we're going to sneak in and get free food and maybe flirt with him. And anyway, pretty quickly, they end up on his private island. Don't go to a private island with a billionaire in a, a spooky movie. Like, we've seen that now. Like, knives out. It happened. We know. Yeah. Don't do it. You're like, bad things are going to happen. And so they get I'm there. Anyway. Just going to say that now. What, what's that? You're going said, anyway. Go yeah. anyway. <laughs> right. So in real life, definitely get on that private plane. Uh, in 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 the movies, definitely do not get on that private plane because I won't tell you what happens to them, but it's not great. Uh, and the best thing about this movie is that uh, the normally very goofy, charming Channing Tatum gets to play someone who is a little bit more of a, a creep, a monster, a sort of weirdo who, well, you'll see where it goes if you see the movie. Sadly, I can't actually recommend the movie. It is, it, mm -hmm. it's, interesting in in some of its specifics but it's just kind of a mess really feels like a debut feature uh, from someone who i think maybe has some promise um there's some good visual ideas here but just on a script level it does not come together it's not very compelling it just doesn't like you you just left with too many questions so um i i would definitely not recommend going out of your way to see this but if you are a social horror completist um then uh, blink twice <laughs> directed by by Zoe Kravitz. Uh, I, I guess it's also the other film it really reminds me of is um, again. I don't want to. I don't want to give away too much, but Stepford Wives, which I just saw the '70s mm -hmm. version of recently for the first time. Um, so, but like, just watch the Stepford Wives. It's a better movie, and not the remake. Uh, so of Wives. Uh, can I uh, throw in an extra fact about Zoe Kravitz? Uh, of course, Matt. Uh, her yes. mother is Lisa Bonet who I think deserves equal yes. billing with Lenny Kravitz. Uh, and Lisa Bonet uh, ultimately was shacking up with Jason Momoa and seems to be the Lady Eve of a race of preternaturally beautiful people and highly talented people. And if we get to a point where we can copy and circulate DNA, I'm going to suggest that maybe we start with... Uh, Lisa Bonet and uh, Lenny Kravitz. That would okay, but they place. tried that with Superman and they ended up with Bizarro and that yeah, was terrible yeah. for everyone involved. Yeah, but you know, we, we know the science now. We've we've got that all linked. Right. Yeah. RFK is not uh, going to let that happen when he's our HHS secretary. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, consumed some very moving culture, maybe not moving in the way that Nick Gillespie ponders Lisa Bonet, but uh, moving nonetheless um uh by accident um uh, a couple of days ago uh driving cross country uh or across the uh, upper midwest and um needed a place to stay there weren't really a lot of i don't know what do you call them towns <laughs> there <laughs> in the allegheny forest uh and so stopped by elmira new york nick gillespie mm -hmm. yeah what did i start to see all around elmira new york mm -hmm. uh like this is samuel clemens parkway and gosh this is another picture of is that Hal Holbrook? No, that's Mark Twain. Yeah. So it turns out Elmira, New York is where Mark Twain uh, wrote many of his books. Uh, and um, there is a Mark Twain uh, Center um, on the uh, campus, very pretty campus of Elmira College. And uh, there's uh, Mark Twain uh, and family um, grave at the cemetery, which is a very Im impressive national cemetery. And that's also kind of moving to go into and see the little whiskey down at the stand of it and other things. His whole family is just like er all, every descendant in the Twain, in the Clemens clan. It didn't work out great for the most part. Um, but the uh, the showstopper for me was his writing room. 
um, which was the uh, the famous octagon. He had a little office shaped like an octagon, windows on all sides. I think eight sides, or at least six, with a fireplace. Um, and they plop it. They've moved it from where it had been perched up on a hill overlooking the nice river uh, in Elmira, Myra, and they just sort of put it. Uh, on the campus uh, of Elmira College, and you can walk in, um, and uh, it's got really uh, beautiful first editions of the stuff, and his little writing table, and everything, and it's just moving. It is really, really moving to sit there in the place where he wrote Huckleberry Finn and Life in the Mississippi and the Gilded Age and all of that stuff. Um, basically, is in that room, and it's just sort of the birthplace of uh, one sense of American letters, and it's great. And I, I can't wait to go back when I'm not in a hurry. Uh, and to uh, visit the Mark Twain Center, which has other stuff and it uh, was uh, unopened when I was going through. But awesome. Uh, really, uh, like it's a beautiful, uh, wonderful little writing place. And uh, and it's really great also to stumble into culture that you uh, didn't have any intention or knowledge about beforehand. Uh, all right. That's all the knowledge we have to drop in this issue of the Reason Roundtable podcast, uh, please consult our other podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. Uh, if you like what we do as an organization, please consider a tax deductible donation <coughs> over at reason.com slash donate. We also tend to have a lot of interesting public events, often featuring Nick Gillespie interviewing people of note. Nick, I wonder if there are any such events going to take place soon in the city of New York. Yeah, and I, I want to plug the next episode of The Reason Interview, which comes out this Wednesday, where I'll be talking with uh, Er Gothrock uh, uh, superstar uh, Australia's own Nick Cave about Ooh. a variety of things. Uh, it's a very interesting conversation, and he's got a great new album coming out. So it's uh, we cover a lot of territory there. Uh, but on uh, September 11th, uh, I'll be interviewing uh, Kat Timpf about her latest book, about all the things that drive us apart and how binary uh, thinking divides us. You can go to reason.com slash events to uh, find out all the details. Uh, some tickets are still available. Uh, we have beer, wine, food, and conversation up the uh, yin yang at these events. So uh, please come on out and go to reason.com slash events for all of our events. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next uh, Tuesday because we're all going to spend Labor Day um, doing the mm. thing, which is barbecues and such like. Okay. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>